welcome everyone. I'm glad to have you join us this afternoon. We're going to, um, we, we've done many iterations of our uh, presentation this afternoon. And what we're going to do is we're going to focus on um, sharing with you something that Steelcase Education has worked um, very hard on over the last number of years, and that's the active learning ecosystem. And we're going to talk about um, the messaging around the active learning ecosystem as it relates to um, design thinking and project-based learning. So um, if we We'll uh, just go through here, and I have a couple of questions for you as we start. And um, as we start, as you walked into the classroom, there were an awful lot of options in terms of where you could go. And many of you did go around the room and explore. I noticed different people uh, checking things out, doing different things, not quite sure where they were to go to sit. Um, and so one of the things that uh, I, I'd like to make sure you're all aware of is that as we conduct our session this afternoon, um, please, you can move around and you can go use whatever it is that you wish. I think it's very important to know that you have permission uh, to move about the room uh, and to work as best suits your needs. Uh, I, when I came in today, I also I noticed that um, there were several whiteboards that had been used over the course of the day. Things were taped, or over the course of the week, things were taped on them. Uh, there were all sorts of different things happening. Uh, we understand that there are um, a variety of preferences that people have in terms of the digital tools that they like to use as well as the analog tools that they like to use. So there are a number of tools in the room uh, that are available for you to use as you conduct, uh, as you are uh, working in the groups that you are um, going to be in today. Now we're not going to have too many groups because we have a very small group here, uh, but nonetheless, please, please feel free um, to use what makes sense for the discussions and the collaboration that you'll be engaged in. So as we start, there are three questions here. Um, reimagine your classroom, or there are not three questions here. As we look at design thinking, what does, what does that mean to you? We tend to use terms very freely, and, and I know that in defining them, um, vocabulary words uh, often mean different things to different people. So what are the key traits that, that come to mind when you think of design thinking? Well, I'm just thinking when I think of design, I think of like backwards design and building design, and it kind of comes up of having a plan and really thinking out what you're going to do. Can I get you just to jot some of these things down using the marker on this paper ta table? Okay, wonderful. What else? Anything else stand out in particular? The process to meet the functionality and uh, the goal of um, a task or, or, or something. Anybody else want to add to that? I think of something that may be nonlinear. Nonlinear? In process. Great. So with that in mind, think of your classroom as it stands today. And as we go through this workshop this afternoon, reimagine your classroom through the eyes of your students. How are you addressing, consider how you're addressing the needs of your students, the evolving needs of your students and their desires. And how does your cu curriculum development and delivery reflect those student needs? And those are things that we think about all the time. But as we go through today, uh, consider, consider these points. So if we, now I, I'm, I feel like I'm tethered to my computer here. We didn't get a clicker to advance our slides. So um, we're, we're, we're going to pair up here as we, we go along. <laughs> Um, if you could, that'd be great. Okay, so if we just uh, advance here. So some of the things that we heard um, are around design thinking capture um, the essence of what we're going to discuss here today. So design thinking is very much human-centered. Um, what do we mean by that? Well, um, we focus on empathy and understanding the needs as well as the, um, as well as the motivations 
uh, of our of of the people that we're working with of our students. It is also um, co very collaborative. We know that when we work together, we're much stronger as a team than when we work individually. It's also something um, where we uh, where it's very optimistic because there's that belief, that fundamental belief, that we can inspire and initiate change. It might be small, it might not be huge, but it's still um, it, it's still you know the fundamental belief there is that we can create something different. And, and then, um, lastly but not least, it's experimental. Um, and so it's that, you, you know, you mentioned earlier how it's a nonlinear process. And that's because we attempt things. Sometimes they work out, other times they don't. Sometimes we fail miserably. But it gives us opportunity to learn from our errors and come up with new ideas uh, with that feedback that we get with the people that we're working with and continue with a new iteration. So with this in mind, if this is how we uh, define design thinking, and then um, we take a look at our goals for this afternoon as we talk about active learning, what we want to do is we want to align on the key challenges that face you in your classrooms. And, and we want to start to explore a new model for active learning. You know, again, as we defined uh, design thinking, if I were to ask each one of you to define the term active learning, you probably all would come up with something that may be similar, but there would be very variations in there and possibly some differences. Um, we want you to have that opportunity to collaborate with your peers. Um, we're going to go around here and see where everyone's from and what your role is. Um, and then and share some of those things that may be successes for you, that are opportunities, that may be challenges. Um, and also, you know, really uh, trying to identify some of those key priorities that you want to focus on as you leave here um, so that we can, we can initiate, inspire uh, some type of um, roadmap for you in terms of where you're going to take um, that active learning that's happening in your classroom um, with, with the uh, design thinking in mind to another level. All right, so any questions with where we're going to go this afternoon with our program? All right, so um, if we just, uh, did, did we happen? Okay, okay, perfect. All right, so I have an activity uh, for you that I'd like you to do, and um, I'm going to hand out um, some sheets that you can capture information on that has this table. Uh, but but um, I would like you to use your personal whiteboards as I distribute those, and you can start thinking about this. Um, but just individually, I want you to think about as you, um, there are three three uh, components here. Uh, one is specific to pedagogy, the other to space, and then technology. So I want you to consider pedagogy and how does it guide your instructional practice. And really think about it in terms of your strengths, the weaknesses that you um, have identified and are working on, um, opportunities as well as barriers to getting to where you want to be. So this is something that we're going to continue to work on throughout the afternoon and add to with different pieces. Um, and then also with respect to space, uh, as educators we often don't think about how we use space. We think about how we set up our classroom, but how do we use that space in our classrooms so that we are addressing the needs, uh, the, the various needs of our students. So again, with respect to strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and barriers, think, think of um, uh, what, you want to, what you want to focus on this afternoon. And then identify the significance and purpose of the technology that you have in your classroom. Oftentimes we have things as a result of grants, specific initiatives, uh, we happen to come across a great deal, or we inherit something, but how how are you using that technology that you have in your classroom? What does it bring to uh, the experiences that you are creating for your students in your classroom? So why don't we start with this group right over here? And I don't know who your spokesperson was. I think someone was not. Oh, <laughs> I thought I heard that you it were was nominated. Three people who nominated. 
<laughs> so, we'll back you up. Okay. What did you What did you want to highlight? We had a lot of rich conversations. I think um, from pedagogy strengths of PBL and uh, collaborative environment and active learning, and it, we want them to give them control over their learning. We want to give control of our students over their ownership of their learning. And then our, our kind of topic about space is do we give them control over the space? You know, and how, how does that all interact? So we give them control of the learning, but not particularly over their space, over the space. So we, we had some good conversations around that. Anything you guys want to add? <laughs> I just think the, the corollary to that is we have, uh, you know, strength of PBL in general is is all these kind of or prescriptive or useful tools and protocols around use of you know need to knows and the, all this, these norms and processes. But yet we don't give them the same parallel control over space or freedom within space. And that, as was pointed out, sometimes the, the freedom that we give them is really a loose of an illusion as opposed to true ownership of their space. So the conflict between ownership of their learning and non-ownership of their space. I love that. I'm going to quote you, illusion of freedom. That's... Uh... That was a team effort. That wasn't... <laughs> we could go a lot of places with that. A lot of places with that. I, I think we could spend a whole afternoon just on that. Excellent. Any comments on what they just shared? It's funny, the keynote, this, or not the keynote, the student closers were just talking about something along those lines, right? Is how in project-based learning, um, and those, those two kids were from uh, Idaho Falls, were, were talking about, you know, impacting their community and, and allowing student choice and that illusion of freedom rings pretty darn true when you come to think about the space that they're in. What were the points that your group wanted to highlight? We, uh, I think our points really coincide with this whole illusion of freedom. Uh, we talked we, we talked about a lot of things, a lot of good things, but uh, particularly we, um, kind of distilled this idea of technology. It's available, there's a lot of it, but it does not necessarily, having technology does is not in and of itself, um, it doesn't teach anybody anything. It doesn't inspire the kinds of performances that we want to see in a cooperative environment. Just because you have it, it, it doesn't, you know, it, so to get from okay, having the tools to seeing the kind of performances that we want students to have requires uh, some scaffolding. There's a nice educational word. Uh, we, we have to kind of show them how to use technology responsibly. That, and so, you know, that, that's a weakness, that's an opportunity. And I guess the, the barrier is kind of getting past this, this thing of, okay, we have the technology and we're done. But no, yeah, we have the technology and now the work begins. So, you know, how do we proceed from there? Okay. Any comments for this group? I'm glad they brought up technology because we didn't spend too much time talking about technology, so I think that that's going to balance the group. But, um, I agree, you know, technology, as we look at, space and interaction of space technology and pedagogy like it's great we're doing a lot we're good at sharing information and learning tools technology tools and my wonder is you know how how, how does tech how can technology promote more social and collaboration instead of some students hiding behind a technology and being not social and not collaborative, and I posted my Google stuff. Leave me alone, right. Right. <laughs> you know. I'm sure we all hear that as teachers, and so I think uh, there's some really interesting um, relationships between all three of these. You know, that makes me think of. Um, you know, I know that you all have some type of virtual component to your learning environments, and I, I was just speaking with a um, a colleague of mine this past week uh, in in a um, 
in a course that we're taking that's completely virtual. And we were discussing the nature of just how valuable the discussion boards were and, and how we could judge uh, by reading those posts, when they were pa posted, the quality of those posts, and just how truly engaged and collaborative um, you know, our classmates were in that process. Uh, and, and what was interesting about that conversation was that as we spoke about that, what we, you know, what we were really um, delving into was the value we attributed to uh, what we were doing. It, it was very measurable by the engagement that we had. And, and so we started talking about engagement and how you evaluate effective engagement. And, and it's very it's quite easy to see, I won't say it's easy, but it's quite easy to see um, when you're, you've got these written posts um, that, you know, aren't just a simple statement, but it's a statement and it's backed up with a number of facts, research, or whatever else it might be. So I think that ties to, uh, to, to, to what you're saying uh, with respect to technology. I, because Drew was with this group, um, I ten, I was sitting here uh, listening to this group, and there were some things here that um, that I and I think I heard some of the same things over here when I started to to, to walk around a bit. Um, but I was taken by, and I think you were the one who was talking about um, incredibly active, interactive classrooms. And I thought, well, what a great way to describe interactivity, incredibly interactive. Can you describe a little bit of that? Because I know everybody was involved in that conversation. Sure. Well, I mean, I think, so when I, when I think of like a, a, an incredibly interactive, or like an intense, you know, interaction that occurs in, in learning is, you know, it's not just students are sitting around a table and talking to each other, but really engaging in a deeper context and, um, you know, using protocols or, you know, following a context where there's a sense of urgency and a sense of excitement, um, or even a sense of struggle and grappling, you know, to come to, um, to come to some sort of next step or next place, um, or to create something, right? So they might be using actual parts and, and building something. They might be like an intense, you know, intellectual conversation. They might be using a new tool and really trying to figure out how to manipulate a program on a, on a, a you know, technological device. Um, but that they're, they're not isolated, they're not quiet, um, they're not um, uncomfortable. Uh, in the sense of, you know, but they, but they are very much like in the moment, very much, you know, trying to engage with each other and, you know, with their task. Um, I guess that's kind of what I, you know, so something like exciting um, and, and quasi, you know, definitely someone could come in and be thinking it would be very dysfunctional. Um, organized chaos. Yes, yes, organized chaos. Organized chaos. Um, and yet, you know, still, you know, um, in, incredibly productive all at the same time. Yeah, that organized chaos is is a wonderful place to be, and it doesn't happen intuitively. It's something that uh, builds over time. And uh, you know, the, the the question I have when we talk about those things is, how do we capture that from one year to the next, as students are moving from one instructor to another? Because we're all so different. We all have those different strengths and weaknesses and, and, and view opportunities in the barriers that are in front of us differently. Um, so how do we do that? Is that something that you focus on in your schools? So, yeah, I mean, the, the schools that I visit, I mean, that's by design. Uh, and that's part of the collaborative process, right? Is the group work? So how do we build time for that? Because I also heard some things about um, consistency with practice. And, and, and as I heard that, I thought, OK, how do we tie that back? Because I'm hearing that possibly time is an issue there. C correct me if I'm wrong. I'm looking for insights there. Well, I, there are some things that obviously can't be controlled. You know, if, if you're given three or four preps, you know, uh, that it's, you're simply not going to be able to focus on um, these, you know, building the kinds of groups that are truly cooperative and not just group or, or group, completely different. Um, but I, I, I do think that what does have to happen within, uh, you know, with the staff is you do have to be intentional about it. 
Uh, and I think you said that. It doesn't happen intuitively. It's something that must be, do you know, there isn't anything else more important to plan than how to get students to be effectively cooperative. That, that needs to be the agenda, you know, not just some sort of, uh, you know, sidebar issue. It, it, it is the, the main course. So. Excellent. We're going to come back to that thought a little later um, a, as we talk about active learning. So any comments with that discussion, that experience? Well, I have a comment. Check out the writing surfaces um, that you used. It was interesting to me to see how you all approached this activity and how um, you, you started to share your thinking um, and, and, and lay it out. Um, not all of you immediately. I, I feel like maybe I put you on the spot to use these. Not all of you instinctively went to that. I, I think there was some hesitation there. Uh, and some folks did want to use um, their computers or other devices. So I, again, um, please feel free to use what you want. But it was a really interesting observation to watch how you approach this, uh, the, 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 this task. Can I just, just, Absolutely. It's interesting because having watched this on the heels of kind of a conference where there was lots of interactive sessions and, and things going on and, and having a lot of sessions where in our model people do use technology a lot and so you're, you know, I mean your comment is like so, you know, spot on like, hey, we're going to have a session, let's pop open a Google, like, yeah. you know, this is what we do, right? Um, mm -hmm. But I feel like, and I had some sessions where, um, you know, this week where people had their laptops open, they were working on a Google Doc and good things were happening, but the level of discourse felt different because heads were down, you know, and eyes were down and, and it was like, it was, you know, I, thinking about this idea, you know, we talk about technology that enables, right? And, and, but I'm also wondering kind of the degree to which it's sort of, you know, again, that sort of barrier piece yeah. and just watching the different groups and it, you know, I've seen groups throughout the week, they sort of lowered their lids, and then all of a sudden, you know, the, the conversation really changed. And so I thought, you know, it was a little bit of a nudge on that, but it was also, I think, really interesting to see that sort of shared space. So that, that's actually why I try to get, like, I do that in my classroom with the notes. I try to have everybody have their notes. So not everybody has to be paying attention to taking notes. You space out and pay attention to what's going on. Notes are still being taken, and it can you you can forget about it and come back and forth. So I'm not trying to defend it. Oh yeah, no, no, it wasn't a kind. It's a great yeah. practice. It's yeah. just interesting in terms of like what you know. What are we hoping to accomplish? In any right, but that's that's. Wait, but it's, it's a link between the tech, between technology and pedagogy. So one of the things that we've talked about is kind of going back to computers around the walls. Mm -hmm. And so that you there's computer time and then there's mm -hmm. collaboration time. Right. And so when you have in space, when you have a screen or two screens between two people, it change it does change the interaction. And is it positive or negative? I I, I don't know, but it certainly is a is a space issue. I think it's something that I've actively managed in my classroom. Like watching watching a team and giving them advice whether okay let's let's put the laptops on and have a conversation and then document because you guys are are just all hiding behind your laptops or sometimes it's okay no let's now let's document that and let's all be on the same google doc and so it's a it's a actively managed process trying you know the technology space and collaboration um, interactions how much of that has to do with personality and the character of the student yeah, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about um, Susan Cain and quiet spaces. I'm not sure how familiar you are with it, but I'd like to hold that thought and bring it back to that um, a, a little later because uh, I think when we, when, we, when we face this issue and really delve into it, um, there's that concept of the introvert and the extrovert and how they behave, the tools that they use. They're, they're very different and some hide behind them. Some are truly, uh, that's their way of processing information that, that helps them in their thinking, so. And also the future too. I mean, sometimes like, we're fun having the students do something on the white paper Oh my God, I'm gonna lose it. You know, like I collect 30 of these team white papers and grade them, and I'm like just post it in Echo and take a picture of it. You know, like <laughs> I think sometimes there's some teacher um, 
you know, leaning towards, depending on the task, what they like, technology or experience. Yeah, our own preferences influence um, our expectations of our students, obviously. Okay. I, I, um, tech, I think we, we, we've covered pretty much everything that I tried to, uh, to capture here. There was another statement that was made um, about... Um, train them about time and space and I heard that in this group also um, quite extensively uh, we have to um, try to think of the expression that you you all used but we need to train them um, about that do we have protocols and I, I can't remember who was speaking now but um, I thought that was a really really interesting conversation because it sounded like something that um, you hadn't really explored as much and it was it was a, an aha moment sort of speak in the context of, of, of this activity uh, so I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that or not but I, I found that interesting I think I was the one that was mentioning that and I mean it's just like any routine you know you want to give students freedom to do anything you have to kind of train them to be responsible with that freedom because if you just let them go to their own devices who knows what they're going to do and sometimes it'll be good but it won't be good for everybody so being, if you want to give freedom of space, you have to train them how to use it effectively so that they're actually using it to do something productive. When I visited one of our elementary schools uh, this winter, and there was, I was in a first grade classroom, and I happened to be getting there like right at a transition, and so the teacher was like, okay, go, and they were building like these rainforests, and all of a sudden they just like got up, and kids are going like in like 50 different directions, but what was in, which is not uncommon in a you know, kind of PDL environment, but they had a whole materials set which, you know, then they went and they were going, they were getting materials, and they, were, they had access to just like all of these different pieces and, and things to get, and, and it felt in a weird way like a level of freedom that I almost don't see 10th graders have. You know, and, you know, and these are seven-year-olds, and they're going and getting things and sharing things and swapping around, it's like, and clearly there had been some training. You know, it was like February, so that the school year hadn't just started, but um, yeah, it just felt like kind of this additional level that I don't think you guys are be thinking about this whole space, illusion of space. Yeah. I just, I, I think they start out being able to have freedom yeah. and be good with it. Yeah. And then we train them to be autonomous, you know, to be like in line. And then we have to retrain them to be free again. But then they become teenagers. Yeah. <laughs> it just messes everything up. That's like that infamous quote, you know, we had it right in kindergarten. Everything I, I needed to learn, I learned in kindergarten. Yeah. But I think this really speaks to knowing the different types of engagement and setting those protocols and, and, and making sure that students are aware. Well, so I, um, I'm going to ask you not to erase what you have because in, in, uh, in, in a bit here we're going to uh, take some snapshots of this and put it together for you. Um, so if you need these whiteboards, you can just flip them over and use the other side for now. Um, so let's, 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 um, let's start talking about active learning. And uh, you know, my, uh, our director of um, behavior envi education environments at Steelcase Education says there is a tsunami building. And that tsunami is building because we have educational leaders that are challenged with so many things. What are those things that, that, that educational leaders are, are challenged with? Any administrators in the group? What are some of those things that you're challenged with as, an, as, a, as the leader? Testing. 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 Why is that a challenge? Well, because of the time that it requires to, just the sheer time that it requires to administer, number mm -hmm. one, to assess, to grade, mm -hmm. to, to collect the, the, the data, to register the data in, in multiple ways and in multiple forms, to interpret the data, to communicate the data that were the challenge is that schools are becoming places for measurement and not places for learning. And that's expressed by so many people in so many different ways, not just leaders, but also, you know, educators, your parents. Um, and, and, yeah. Um, so, you know, uh, seen as, as, as a barrier, but, you know, there, there, are, um, there are a number of, of, of challenges here. Um, it's not just assessment. It's also related to funding and, and all these other things that, um, that, that are on this list. Um, and and I, making face-to-face -face relevant in a climate of disruptive online delivery models. I'm sure you all have <laughs> thoughts on, on, on that, but this is becoming 
uh, more and more prevalent in conversations, uh, not just at the administrative level, um, but also at the classroom level with, 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 uh, with teachers and parents. So despite all these changes, um, or despite all the needs for changes, um, we continue to see classrooms that have a very traditional look and feel, okay? Um, and, and so, you know, you look at this, I think there's some technology in the corner, um, but you look at the tables, the chairs, the way that this is set up, well, we can move things around. So again, a very uh, human-centered approach uh, to the research that we do. And so, you know, here are some pictures of some of the, um, some of the classrooms that we tend to, to see a lot of. What do you observe here? I'm sorry? There's a single focal point. Single focal point. Mm -hmm. What else? There are different levels of engagement. Very different levels of engagement. If I look at that back corner compared to, 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 to in the front, anything else? I'm sorry? No rows. No rows. <laughs> no, there aren't any rows. No rows, and it's just all uncomfortable to me. Whether it's like the size of the chairs compared to, I don't know. Well, it's forced totally to be awkward. <laughs> you think they're where they want to be? Yeah, different perspectives in how we look at that. Um, you know, I, I, I look at look at this girl at the on the um, right hand corner, the way she's sitting backwards in that chair. Um, I, I don't know. I think you could interpret that as comfortable or not so comfortable. Um, you know, some of them are definitely strained and, and, and some of them are definitely disengaged. What do you see here? Rearranging. Who's doing the rearranging? Teacher, probably. The teacher with the back problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you know, definitely something. I, I, I think the one positive attribute that I see in this is that it's not happening while students are in the classroom. Um, what about here? Oh, why do I? So I was asked to explain why do I think it's positive that it's happening while students are not in the room. I say that strictly from an instructional time uh, point of view. Um, you know, oftentimes many struggle with um, getting things the way they want them, and it takes away from that time that you have together in class. What about here? Well, they all seem very engaged yeah. and on task. But different collaboration mm -hmm. cells. Going on here in groups. A lot of different collaborative cell, uh, collaboration cells, absolutely. What else? At least one person smiled. <laughs> There's different activities going <laughs> on. So it looks like some people may be asking questions, some people are working in groups. Yeah. You could bring coffee. Yeah, you could bring coffee. <laughs> You know, when I first saw this picture, it was, uh, okay, we definitely everybody has um, technology available to them. Um, and, and it was interesting to see the, compu the, the paper in front of the computer uh, in terms of note taking. That, that, that's what stood out to me with, with, with this. The room setup was different, yeah. too. You got two rows in the front, and then maybe a team table in the back, and then people standing around chalkboards. So the setup of the room is, is different. I think it's also interesting to note that every one of you work in a one-to-one, -one, so the technology wasn't a surprise. No, right, yeah. Nothing to even be mentioned. So one of the very first insights that we, um, or, or an insight that I wanted to highlight for you, there are two here, is one, that classrooms often pose physical and psychological barriers uh, to both teaching and learning. Um, and, and I think, you know, that the, those pictures captured some of that. Um, here again, what do we see? Lack of space, maybe. Lack of space. Clutter. Very much so. <laughs> the positive thing here is that this student looks very intent on what they're doing, despite some of those barriers that you've identified. What about here? They're taking a standardized test. They're taking a standardized test. <laughs> 
I, you know what? I don't think so. Not in that formation. What about here? Like typical floor in my classroom. <laughs> What's the issue here with that? What's well, about safety and you know, there's, there's a tripping. Yeah, kids yeah. tripping on stuff. So, and so safety. Laptops potentially. But if that's what that is. I'm not sure if that's a laptop or a laptop. Um, but there's, there's power, yeah. Yeah, yeah there's definitely some type of device there. I see product placement with the Google bag. <laughs> <laughs> that wasn't strategically placed, I don't think. <laughs> okay, so, so, so the safety issue here, um, I, I think also um, I, we could talk about responsibility, uh, ownership for, for the tools and, 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 and respect, if you will. seats, too. Yeah. This looks like a tight space. I mean, you've got yeah. the alley right there. <laughs> so it just seems like there's not a lot of room. Mobility? Yeah. And, and again, here I think it's it's not just for the students. Um, this also, in terms of the 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 teacher, um, I mean, it looks like there's some some teacher stuff up there too. Tables moved off to the side. Yeah. How, how we're using what we have in there. So our second insight. Uh, is around that, that classrooms often don't support the individual needs of students and instructors. So with all of this uh, research that's been done, um, we, we've um, identified a position and, and formed a, a concept, if you will, of what we call the active learning ecosystem. And this ecosystem uh, is based on three components, pedagogy, space, and technology. And uh, we're going to break these down uh, in a moment. But as a result of, um, a, a, as a result of this, um, we've been able to address a number of solutions. And, and those applications look like the seating that you're in right now, which is called Node. It um, also reflects the tables that we have in the back used with these same chairs, but what you have um, is a writing surface here. And so with Verb, um, these, this particular uh, table um, seating collection uh, provides a, whole, a holistic uh, approach to that classroom environment with the table um, and chairs together along with these personal whiteboards. We have Mediascape, that's the tool that you um, use to sign in today, uh, which allows for, as I said earlier, collaboration, but also co-creation of content. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later about you know, how you go about planning intentfully for co-creation where everybody has uh, a responsibility for a piece of that, uh, of that content, that final product. And the issues um, that um, we, you know, we obviously wanted to address were, first of all, the students that are coming into our classrooms. Um, 21st century learners are, you know, our students today have a very different set of, uh, have a different skill set um, in, in uh, as related to, or as many believe is influenced by technology, um, but it's a different type of, of learner. And that different type of learner is still coming to a very traditional uh, education setting. And, you know, uh, of course, this is quite exaggerated with, with, with the uh, type of chair that's in here and, and also the way this class is, is set up. But I think you understand the messaging here. So when we talk about active learning, um, we, we want to be able to define uh, the concept of active learning so that uh, everybody is thoughtfully um, considering all the pieces. So we're going to jump into a poster session here um, where we're going to focus on this ecosystem and as we do so we're going to um, look at each of these components which traditionally have always been dealt with independent of one another. And, and so within our um, ecosystem, you know, we, we feel very strongly that, um, and, and research demonstrates, that to achieve student success, everything has to be driven by pedagogy. It's pedagogy that needs to lead the way. Um, and 
once we look at what it is, identified that content and how it's going to be delivered, that's when we select what tool is best served for that activity and in what space and, and, and what type of space is needed to accommodate um, the kinds of behaviors that are going to influence the discoveries that students make. So um, we're going to focus on learning preferences. Uh, as well as the technology um, that we have available to us uh, and, and the space. And so I'm just going to click through um, these slides and, and, and jump right to, to here. So um, with our active, lurking, uh, active e learning ecosystem, as I said, um, you see pedagogy at the top for a reason. Space and technology are like two pillars that are supporting that pedagogy um, and ensuring that that, that takes the forefront um, in, in our classrooms rooms. And so this is how we define active learning. It's, you know, uh, acquisition of knowledge that is acquired through a variety of experiences, whether they be independent, whether they be dyadic, in, in teamwork, but all of these variations prove to support uh, more deeply engaged individuals in that process of learning. So as we think about design thinking or as you're doing um, project-based learning, you know, what in terms of curriculum needs attention? What are you going to be intentional about? I, I thought about this as, as that conversation was going on earlier. What specifically are you going to be intentional about um, and, and, and need to address? Um, how are you going to you yourself experiment and branch out um, to allow students a variety of opportunities to take the lead for that more student-centric um, environment that you're working in. Um, what are those processes and, and tools? How are you going to break routine um, so that uh, you can be using the space that you have differently uh, for a variety, uh, for addressing the variety of learning preferences that exist. And, and I think also as we, we look at design thinking and we talk about the systems, we can't always change those systems, but we can, we, we can select different pieces that we can influence in how we interact and engage with the community um, and, and, and that sort of thing to, to make a difference for the kind of learning that our, our, our students are engaged Thank in. You. It's been a wonderful conference, so safe travels to everyone Thank back you. home. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.